Chapter 3, When, page 5. Sooner or later, the let loose sidewalk pups will cross the streets. Running, they will run into each other. And sooner or later, as surely as noses drip downward, it will no longer be enough to merely run. They must run against something, against each other. It is their instinct. Let's race, one will shout, and they race. From the trash can, from trash can to corner, from stop sign to mail truck. Their mothers holler at them for running in the streets, so they go to the alleys. They take over the alleys, make the alleys their own streets. They race. They race in July and they race in January. They race in the rain and they race in the snow. Although they race side by side, they are actually racing away from each other, sifting themselves apart. I am fast. You are slow. I win. You lose. They forget, never to remember again, that they are pups from the same litter. And they discover something. They like winning more than losing. They love winning. They love winning so much that they find new ways to do it. Who can hit the telephone pole with a stone? Who can eat the most cupcakes? Who can go to bed the latest? Who can weigh the most? Who can burp the loudest? Who can grow the tallest? Who is first? 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 Who? 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 Burping, growing, throwing, running. Everything is a race. There are winners everywhere. I win! I win! I win! The sidewalks, the backyards, the alleyways, the playgrounds. Winners. Winners. Except for Zinkoff. Zinkoff never wins. But Zinkoff doesn't notice. Neither do the other pups. Not yet. Page 8, Chapter 4, Zinkoff's First Day. Zinkoff gets in trouble his first day of school. In fact, before he even gets to school, he's in trouble with his mother. Like the other neighborhood mothers of first day, first grade children, Mrs. Zinkoff intends to walk her son to school. First day is a big day, and mothers know how scary it can be to a six-year-old. Zinkoff stands at the front window, looking at all the kids walking to school. It reminds him of a parade. His mother is upstairs getting dressed. She calls down, Donald, you wait. Her voice is firm, for she knows how much her son hates to wait. By the time she comes downstairs, he's gone. She yanks open the door. People are streaming by. Mothers hold the hands of younger kids while fourth and fifth graders yell and run and rule the sidewalks. Mrs. Zinkoff looks up the street. In the distance, she sees the long neck of a giraffe poking above the crowd, hurrying along with the others. It's him. Must be him. He loves his giraffe hat. His dad bought it for him at the zoo. If she has told him once, she has told him 50 times. Do not wear it to school. The school is only three blocks away. He will be there before she can catch him. With a sigh of surrender, she goes back into the house. The first grade teacher stands at the doorway as her new pupils arrive. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to school. When she sees the face of a giraffe go by, she nearly swallows her greeting. She watches the giraffe and the boy under it march straight to a front row desk and take a seat. When the bell rings, the teacher, Miss Meeks, shuts the door and stands before the desk of the unusually hatted student. The other students are openly giggling. She wonders if this boy is going to be a problem. This is Miss Meek's year to retire, and the last thing she needs is a troublesome first grader. That's quite a hat you have there, she says. It is, in fact, remarkably lifelike. The boy pops to his feet. He beams. It's a giraffe. So I see. But I'm afraid you'll have to take it off now. We don't wear hats in the classroom. Okay, 
he says cheerfully. He takes off the hat. You may be seated. Okay. He seems agreeable enough. Perhaps he will not be troublesome after all. Now she has to tell him that he cannot keep the hat with him. She hopes he won't break out bawling. First graders can be so unpredictable. You never know what might set them off. She tells him. She keeps an eye on his lower lip to see if it will quiver. It does not. Instead, he pops to his feet again and brightly chirps, Yes, ma'am, and hands the hat to her. Yes, ma'am. Where did that come from? She smiles and whispers, Thank you. Down now. He whispers back, Yes, ma'am. Twenty-six heads turn to follow her as she carries the three-foot hat to the cubby holes at the back of the room. She labeled the cubbies the day before, and now she suddenly realizes she doesn't know which one belongs to the boy. She turns. What's your name, young man? He jumps to attention and belts at full voice. Zink off! She has to turn her face to keep from laughing out loud. In all her 30 years of teaching, she has never known a student to announce himself or herself in such a manner. She turns back to him and gives a slight bow, which somehow seems to be called for. Thank you. And no need to shout, Mr. Zinkoff. Do you have a first name? The class is a Twitter. Donald, he says. Thank you, Donald. And you may keep your seat. There is no need to raise when you speak. There's no need to rise when you speak. Yes, ma'am. The cubbies, as the classroom seating soon will be, are in alphabetical order. She goes straight to the last cubby hole and inserts the giraffe. The space is not deep enough to hold it at all. It looks as if a baby giraffe is napping in there. The thought comes to her that Donald Zinkoff, in more ways than cubby holes, will always be easy to find.